Well, it's been an excruciating, hold on a sec, two months since our last Pinocchio movie and Hollywood can't seem to get enough. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? Following in the footsteps of Disney's animated classic, the live action remake, and whatever the hell this is, acclaimed director Guillermo del Toro has thrown his hat into the ring in telling the story of a boy whose appendage gets bigger the more he tells lies. So basically the superpower I wanted as a teenager. And who better to tell the story than the guy who created this? Join me as we take a deep dive into this fantastical tale, and I promise I won't tell a lie. I can't lie! Now you might think the main character of this tale is Pinocchio. Heck, the movie's even named after him. But Pinocchio himself doesn't even show up until 20 minutes into the movie. I think the main character is actually Pinocchio's father, Geppetto. He's the character who goes through the biggest fundamental change. He's voiced by David Bradley, who you might remember from Harry Potter or Game of Thrones. Unlike other versions of the Pinocchio tale, Del Toro spends the first act of the movie recounting the story of Geppetto and his son Carlo. The two shared an inseparable bond, working together and enjoying life until in 1916, during World War I, Carlo is killed by a military bomber, ironically in a place meant for peace, a church. Earlier, Carlo found the perfect pine cone, which Geppetto will bury next to Carlo's grave and will grow into a tree that will be used to create Pinocchio. In fact, the first and last image of the movie is a pine cone, a symbol of life. Geppetto even tells Carlo when they chop down a tree, When one life is lost, another must grow. This cycle of life and death is something highlighted throughout the movie, as we'll see Pinocchio die and resurrect several times. It's ironic since there's even a moment in the film where he looks up to Christ on a crucifix and wishes he could be like him, the biblical figure who also resurrected. Both Geppetto and Christ's father, Joseph, not to mention Christ himself, were carpenters. So there's a lot of religious symbolism at play here. At least 20 years passed since the death of Carlo in 1916 and the arrival of Jiminy Cricket, or should I say Sebastian J. Cricket. Pretty sure Disney still holds the rights for Jiminy, so they had to change it. Sebastian is a writer looking for a nice place of solitude to write his memoir. So where does he settle? The very tree Geppetto chops down one drunken night after getting mad at God for not answering his prayers. I mean, we've all been there, right? In his drunken stupor, Geppetto carves the tree into the shape of a boy, and during the night, a spirit voiced by Tilda Swinton appears. Now, Sebastian isn't going to give up his home to this spirit without a fight, so the spirit offers him a deal. If the cricket promises to watch over and teach Pinocchio to be good, she'll grant him one wish. Sebastian loves this idea, as he can use this wish to make him a famous writer. Geppetto is understandably terrified when he finds out his wooden creation has been brought to life, but isn't so thrilled when the boy interrupts church service revealing himself to the town. Now a lot has changed since the death of Carlo. Benito Mussolini's fascist regime has taken control and things aren't as great as they once were. With Pinocchio's reveal, it seems everyone wants to exploit the boy for their own gain. One such character is Count Volpe, voiced by Christoph Waltz. Ooh, that's a bingo! Volpe translates to Fox, and his character is definitely a predatory one, wanting to use Pinocchio to return his circus and puppet show back to its glory days. When Geppetto finds out Pinocchio has been secretly performing for the Count, he goes to retrieve him and Pinocchio is hit by a car. This is the first of many Pinocchio deaths. Because he's not a real boy, he's not bound to the same rules as you and I. In this sort of afterlife world, four black rabbits, voiced by Tim Blake Nelson, take Pinocchio to their boss, the sister spirit to the one we saw at the beginning of the film. She tells him that he will die many times and that he is cursed to return over and over again until he eternity. After he's brought back to life, we meet another character named Podesta, voiced by Del Toro alum Ron Perlman. He's a fascist government official who sees the benefit in having a soldier who can't die. Pinocchio would make a great addition to the patriotic youth military project, but Geppetto isn't having it. He takes Pinocchio, and on their way home, the two get in a fight. All Pinocchio has ever been to him is a burden, and he's nothing like his son, Carlo. Because I'm not Carlo. 
I don't want to be like Carlo. Carlo is- Enough! In the middle of the night, Pinocchio leaves to join the circus. In his mind, this is the perfect solution to solving the burden problem. He can gain money by working at the circus while avoiding the war. Pinocchio, however, still has the naivete of a young boy and doesn't know that the Count is simply using him and not sending any money back to his father. Speaking of his father, he's set out on a quest to find Pinocchio, but on his journey is swallowed by a giant sea creature. This is a bit of a departure from previous versions which depict this creature as a whale. Meanwhile, Pinocchio finds out that life at the circus isn't all that it's cracked up to be. The Count works him to the bone, or should I say stump, and even cuts part of his nose when he sticks up for the monkey Spaziatura, who is voiced by Kate Blanchett. Spaziatura means trash in Italian, so Pinocchio plans to ruin the Count's big show in front of Mussolini himself. Although he has very little lines, Mussolini is performed by Tom Kenny, who voiced Spongebob. These antics get Pinocchio killed by Mussolini, and his body brought into the custody of Podesta, who trains him to become a soldier. There, Pinocchio befriends Candlewick, Podesta's son, and Candlewick feels like his father doesn't love him. I'll show him I'm no coward. I'll make him like me. It's here Pinocchio learns a valuable lesson, something Cricket tried to tell him earlier, that sometimes those we love say things they don't mean. But with time, they learned they never really meant it at all. This all goes back to Geppetto calling Pinocchio a burden, something he may have meant in the moment but didn't truly mean. During a war game, Pinocchio and Candlewick face off against each other with the game coming out at high. Podesta orders his son to shoot Pinocchio, but Candlewick refuses. He's doing what is good and right, and whether he knows it or not, standing up to his father shows just how courageous he is. The camp comes under attack and an explosion lands Pinocchio right back into the Count's control. The Count even mounts him up on a cross for some added Christian symbolism. It's Spazatura now who has the chance to do what is right, fighting off his former master and shoving him off the cliff. Pinocchio and Spaz survive the fall only to be sucked into the same creature Geppetto's in. The two are reunited and embrace, but that still leaves them with the problem of escaping the belly of the beast. Pinocchio's ability to grow his nose every time he tells a lie comes in handy here as they're able to use it to tickle the creature's blowhole and escape. That sounded weird. Pinocchio is sucked in again, but this time along with a sea mine, allowing Pinocchio to sacrifice himself, destroying the creature and saving his father. The blast is so powerful, Geppetto's fate is left in the balance, but Pinocchio can't do anything because he's dead. In this version of Pinocchio, he must wait a certain length of time before he's brought back to life, but he needs to get back to Geppetto right now to save him. There is one solution. If Pinocchio breaks the hourglass, he'll be resurrected immediately, but return as a mortal, essentially meaning this would be his last life. And that's exactly what Pinocchio does, coming back to the real world and saving Geppetto, but dying in the process. It's a selfless act to save the person he cares for most. It's here Geppetto calls Pinocchio his son for the first time. And instead of wanting Pinocchio to be the son that he lost, he loves Pinocchio for who he is. Don't be Carlo, or anyone else. Be exactly who you are. And remember how Cricket had one wish if he turned Pinocchio into a good boy? Well, he decides to selflessly use his wish to bring Pinocchio back to life. Geppetto, Pinocchio, Spaz, and Cricket live out the rest of their days as we see Pinocchio live on as his loved ones, one by one, grow old and die. He buries his father in Spaz and keeps Cricket's body in a matchbox in his chest. And you may think this is a sad ending, but it's really quite beautiful. They all get to live the rest of their lives happily together. Not much is known about what happened to Pinocchio after this, but it's said that he too will one day die, and perhaps that will make him a real boy. The movie ends with an acorn falling, highlighting the cycle of life and death, or as the movie puts it, What happens, happens. And then, we are gone. Perhaps the film's biggest departure from the 1940 film is that Pinocchio never becomes an actual human boy. Rather, it questions our notion on what it means to be real. So what did you think of Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio? Should Pinocchio have turned into a real boy? I want to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everyone. For more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... Father, when can I leave to be on my own?